this is uh, kind of a standalone scene, but I think it's beautiful. Um, and guys, again, see, check out your check out your reviews. Um, they, the reviews are in. It looks like we're going to be around for another night at least. So um, this last scene is set on um, the way to confront Charlie in Vegas and Gemma and Isaac, who uh, are, are traveling together in the, um, one of the last surviving cars. And along the way, they encounter a group of kids unlike any they've ever met. And these people are from the middle of the country and kind of the Rocky Mountains, places where survival has been a lot harder and the children are nearly wiped out. And these are the last of them. So in this one, uh, Gemma is once again played by Sienna. Uh, Isaac and Tallboy, actually, you know what, I, I realized this is, this is where we messed up before. Um, I'm gonna say Isaac is played by Rizo. Uh, Basket Girl is played by Paloma. Um, Onion Boy and Tall Boy are played by Teo, and Rope Girl is played by Charlotte Sweat. So, all right, so let's dive into this one. Um, the debris moves, sticks fall down, tires roll away. Gemma is so puzzled from the shapes emerging from them that she doesn't think to run. If the debris looks like a junkyard, then the shapes look like walking piles of junk. They clank toward her, slow enough and small enough that she's more fascinated than alarmed. The shapes seem like children, but children born down with boxes and boards and pots and bows. The awkward shapes remind Gemma of little crabs she found on the beach of the camp, scurrying around in other animal shells. Sometimes she would watch one drop, one shell, only to find a bigger shell and climb into it, soft-bodied and naked. The spirals were top-heavy and wobbly, and the crabs looked drunk when they walked. Then faces of the children emerge from the bundles, and Gemma wonders if, like the crabs, this is their protection from the world. They are pink mostly, but not like the biters who are all blonde and blue-eyed. 10 of the kids have red hair and freckles. Even in the dark, their hair is brighter than Isaac's. They shuffle into a rough half circle around her. Alarm finally flashes at their hungry looks. Gemma knows a lot of cannibals already. Why couldn't these be more of them? She lifts the gun to her shoulder and they stop. She isn't sure if it's for the gun or for the motion itself. You know what this thing is? It's a stick. It's a stick. The strangled twangs are so different from the accents of LA that Gemma has to replay the words in her head to understand their meaning. It'll hurt you if you get closer. One gar girl carries a basket on her head. It's a shooter, I've seen it. The accent starts to sound more familiar. The only time she's heard it is in movies the old guys called Westerns. I just wanna be on my way. We ain't gonna hurt you. We just wanted to see what you was. We saw that thing that you were in from a long ways away and we wanted to take a look. It's a car, sort of. Car. Sort of. Car. Gemma scans the, scans the crowd for weapons. There are some, bows and machetes and scar sharpened sticks, but no one makes an effort to reach for them. More than that, no one makes an effort at all. She sees a wariness in their face, a shadow of the last lifers. There's something else that's wrong now that she thinks of it. There's no haze following them. That's why she couldn't see them. Who are you? We're what's left. We're the only ones still living. In your home. In the world. It's a boy with a box of onions. The rest speak in fragments and Gemma stitches the story together from pieces. Most of them come from far inland, scattered in and near the band of mountains that Gemma has seen running up the center of old America. Maybe somewhere descended from the people who took in Isaac. They didn't live together there. Most of them just woke up one morning and realized they were the only ones left the last three in a sprawling city, the only voice in a long gone hotel, the last to harvest crops in a mountain valley growing cold. A tall boy steps forward. He works his jaw several times as if practicing for speech. Now I lived in a canyon, just me and a goat and 40 steps in the spring, and I got taller. Then that was five less steps to know. Some of them went years without speaking to another soul. Most don't have names. They must have heard something like a distant memory about the ocean and the place next to it, where the winter never comes and they could end in comfort because they flowed separately down the hills and valleys toward the sea, smaller creek joining smaller creeks until they formed the little river staring at Gemma and Isaac. They carried their only belongings on their back as if, should they lose them, they lose whatever it was they used to be. Who were you? We don't know. Before the end came, I mean. We don't know. Wait, you never got told about the end? Not even in stories? Never had no stories. Never had no one to tell us no stories. That wasn't true among the Angelinos or the Biters of the kingdom. They were people of the story. 
The story gives life meaning. The story tells who you are. What happened? What, what's the end? So Gemma tells them the story. At first, she starts to tell them the story of the Hollywood, the one that gets told every night about the first mamas. Then she thinks, this ain't their story. More than that, that story is about to run out. The emptiness in the children's eyes has been bothering her until she realizes where she's seen it. It's the look of almost every old guy except James and Alice. Resignation, despair, the sense that the world has no room for them because they have lived beyond all their stories. So she tells a new story about the wind plague. It doesn't last long. Everything she tries to explain are things most children don't have the words for anymore. And she has to repeat herself every few words. How long has it been since I've had to talk with normal kids, she wonders. The Gemma who could do that lived in another time. So Gemma starts again. Once there was a demon who was jealous of the people below. It wanted to love how they loved, breathe how they breathe. It couldn't do that, so it cursed them, sent them into a magic, a powerful haze, and froze in the world for a hundred years. It ended people when they came old enough, strong enough, brave enough to fight it. As she says it, she realizes that she's right, that this is Charlie's story. Charlie believes it can't live if humans do. The children were crushed into nothing. They were hanging on to life. But what the demon didn't understand was the deepness of their hearts. The children sent two warriors to hunt the demon. They were frightened of the demon, but they knew their magic was stronger than its haze. They tracked the demon to its cave and challenged it to fight. How does it end? How do you want it to end? Because Gemma doesn't know the end yet. The warriors capture the demon. They eat it. The warriors get eaten. Everyone shakes their head at that. Gemma notices something of the kids get more animated. Little sparks of the haze floating around them. The haze had not recognized them as human enough to swarm, but now it comes. A tiny girl with a belt of coiled rope covered, covering her entire belly speaks up. We help the warrior. The other children nod. We tame the magic. We make it work for us. Gemma nods slowly, considering the kids. Can you fight? Rope girl pulls a bow off her back and aims an arrow at the tip of a flagpole half lit by the fire. It strikes it dead in the center and clings to the deck. We can hunt. There's not just an ocean at the end of this road. The Angelinos will give you a home. Gemma tells them how to find the towers of downtown. The Angelinos will know what to do with a couple dozen hunters in the coming war. The sparks of haze grow thicker around them. The cries get more excited. The leftover children are now making themselves part of the story. And Gemma is starting to understand the story she still needs to tell. And scene. Good job, guys. I'm like, I'm gonna clap for everyone else because I know they are out there. Um, we should do an audiobook of Scorpion and Mayfly. That's a great idea. We'll get on that. Clap, clap, clap. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, we're, we, we are seriously thinking about doing this as a potential series where we just bring in other authors and have them narrate it like this. So if you guys are interested, that may be on the docket sometime this summer.